You guys, uh, you won't, ex you, will you excuse me if I preach from over here? There's an air conditioning unit right here. Can you still hear me okay? I don't mind standing right here. <laughs> this is good. That's a better, that's actually a better thought. I could stand in front of that thing over there. Uh, good morning. I hope you're all <laughs> taking in lots of water. Lots and lots of H2O and, and, and trying to get as much of that into your system as possible. Um, what's that? It's a what? Oh. So while, while uh, Angie kind of just mentioned something, I'm going to ask us to sing happy birthday real quick. Angie had a birthday. When was that? All right, hey, um, yeah. let's, yeah, isn't it just sticky? It's it, it, unreal, unreal. Let's pray. Then we'll stand and we'll worship, and uh, maybe all the time we're singing, we'll create a little bit of a funnel, and it'll just kind of cool us off. Father God, um, in the midst of even just a little bit of uncomfortableness, and it is just a little bit of uncomfortableness, God, in the reality of things that go on across the world, but God, we just ask for your time today to be a blessing back to you. Uh, that our hearts and minds would be stayed and focused upon you. And as we get ready to open up your word, Father, uh, prepare our hearts as we sing, as we worship who you are. Prepare our hearts, till it, plow it up so that we can hear your word and receive it. So that, God, it would be you that changes us to make us more and more like you. Your, your powerful, powerful word, God. Father, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. It's okay if you don't clap your hands and stand. I won't be offended. <laughs> I can't even have a fan on me because of my sheets. You give me up whenever I... I need 
What you've done in me, oh Lord Yeah, yeah, yeah Go ahead and have a seat real quick, and we're going to pray today, and we're going to, I know we already sang one round of happy birthday, but we're going to double that up today, okay? You're just going to up the ante just a skosh more. Uh, when we pray today, uh, we're not going to release the kids today, um, so what we're going to do is just uh, pray over a couple of items, one of them, uh, items, I guess it's people rather than items that we pray over, but uh, Beth McCarter not feeling well. Uh, we are going to pray that uh, whatever it is that God restores her and strengthens her and heals her up. Uh, and then for anybody else that might be feeling it, whatever that might be, okay? Um, let's pray, and then we'll sing one more round of happy birthday. Father, we uh, come before you with needs and, and desires and praise before um, you already know what they are. 
But God, you love it when we express to you what it is that's on our hearts. And today, God, we lift up Beth to you and ask God that your healing hand would be on her. Even as we mention her name right now, Father, that your healing hand, your Holy Spirit's power would settle on her. Allow her to feel and sense your busyness in her health to restore her, God. We ask God that you just uh, work through all that, that whole beautiful family and, and then heal her up, God. Lord, there's a lot of stuff going on with the smoke, the heat, uh, a lot of sickness, a lot of illness in terms of related to the smoke. Uh, we lift up all the firefighters, all the emergency crew workers, everybody that's associated with uh, battling these fires, not just here, but all over the place. And I think about all over the globe with, with earthquakes, with floods, uh, um, all kinds of things that are taking place, God, and they're all under your watchful eye. So, God, we take comfort in that knowing that you are in the middle of every bit of it. And Lord, help us to hang on to you. Help us to grab on to your, your, your coattails and not let go. For it's in your coattails, in your hands, that we find peace and strength to be able to endure. So God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody turn in 14. Addy. 14 years. Oh, everybody's pointing quickly. It's not me. It's her. So we're going to sing happy birthday to Addie, okay? Happy birthday. Addie, you got to love it. Even the bro was singing a little bit back there. I was watching him. He was singing a little bit, man. Um, I'm going to give you a quick update on, on Open Bible and the stuff. And those of you watching uh, at home as well. And that is that um, uh, we voted, we've decided as a church family to join Open Bible. Uh, I, Jennifer and I had a really good Zoom meeting with Gary Hebden, the, one of the gentlemen that came and spoke with Chris. And then Gary came after that and spoke with us as well. And... Um, Really good conversation about leadership, about process, about next steps. So uh, I am drafting a letter uh, that will be sent to the regional office and the national office that basically says we are, we've made a decision as a church family to join. We request um, a charter membership uh, under Open Bible. Uh, that will go to the regional and then the national office for approval or disapproval. Uh, Gary said he doubts it's going to be disapproved, but he said you never know, and when it hits the national office, what could happen. Uh, but he's pretty confident that, that, that this will go through. Um, we, uh, uh, we chatted a little bit about the, uh, after that what happens, and what I have to do is go through a licensing process. It's not heavy duty at all. Uh, there is a higher level of that, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's a certification that is specific to this church. It doesn't transfer anywhere else. And since this is probably our last stop, I'm okay doing that. Okay? We don't need to move on to another spot. Um, but um, once that's done, then they begin the process of getting in order uh, the, the paperwork, the documentation that pulls us into uh, uh, being an open Bible uh, church. Uh, the bylaws, that the, the templates that they've given us for bylaws, they're, they're good, they're straightforward. They encompass membership. We're gonna, you're going to hear membership talked about, whether people want to join, uh, be a, a member of this church, and reasons why, uh, benefits why, and all that kind of stuff, along with how we go through the process of, of selecting and appointing new board members, elders, etc. So a lot of things that will change and will, will begin to kind of take place. But it was encouraging to really spend some time talking with Gary, who you know him, if you've heard him speak, you know his heart uh, is for you, uh, primarily it's for Christ. And uh, it was just really, really a good conversation about the new kind of chapter in this church family. And, and it's exciting to see that. Okay, so just to give you an update on it, um, again, I've asked over the last several, I don't know how long, more than a couple months, but a while, to give me any kind of feedback, any information that you thought after the general meeting on that Saturday and after they spoke, Gary spoke, uh, all I've heard is all positive uh, and a couple of concerns. And those concerns are, are, like Gary said, it's what he loved about hearing the concerns is it tells him and tells me that you're invested in this. You want clarification. You want to be able to understand some things, which I did too. And we've talked out a lot of our differences, which is great. Uh, anyway, just so you, you give you a heads up about what, uh, where we're at, and he thought probably, we made our decision before August 1st, which was the, the time frame for him, and he thought probably by end of October, early November, 
uh, would be about the time we become uh, Open Bible. Okay? Name change will stay. I mean, the name Granite Lake Community Church will, change, will stay the same. Uh, it will probably be Granite Lake Community Church of the Open Bible, something like that, officially. It doesn't have to appear anywhere else other than that for the charter to take place. Okay? Do any of you have any questions about it, just out of curiosity? Given lots of time for that to take place, not to say that you can never ask questions again, but just wanted to give you an update, okay? So let's stand back up and let's sing some more, okay? good to be saved. It's good to have a happy day. Amen. I am guilty. Ashamed of what I've done. These hands are dirty I dare not lift them up To the Holy One Sing it now You 
plead my cause You right my wrongs You break my chains You overcome You gave your life To give me mine You say that I am free How can it be? Absolutely, Yvonne. <laughs> As we get ready to receive our morning offering, I'm also going to pass this around in terms of volunteers for Children's Church. Um, desperate need, I'm going to tell you that. Desperate need for volunteers to help downstairs. I'm going to, I know that um, Carrie's feeling a little bit better. Mom and Dad are doing okay. Um, and hanging in there. Jennifer's been trying to fill in as best possible. And Gabby's going to be leaving us in a few weeks which means we've got a major vacancy taking place. Um, so I'm going to ask you to be praying about that uh, as we uh, move forward, uh, that we're going to definitely need some folks to step into, into the gaps for everybody, okay? Father, we uh, place that need before your cross, Lord. You knew it was going to happen before we ever mentioned it to you. You knew that this change in our church family was going to take place. And so, Father, we praise you for knowing all these things, and as we press into you, Father, you press into us so that we might be able to have your wisdom, your Holy Spirit's power, and the, the wisdom of your, um, your word that speaks to us and changes us, God. 
Is that me? Mute the bass. Yeah. Sorry. Woo -hoo -hoo. Oh, oh, I don't know where I was at, but let's keep praying. <laughs> Father, as we get ready to receive our offering, uh, Lord, let our, our form of giving be of worship, a form of worship to you to be able to give back a portion of what you provide to us with a glad and cheerful heart. God, uh, the privilege, the honor, and the responsibility of being part of your work through what we give, not just with our time and our talents, but God, with our treasures. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if you've seen this beautiful look. Can I come back and grab her for, for a second? Not, maybe not grab her, but just borrow her for a second. This is uh, Love Little Critters. Can I borrow you? You... This is just too good, man. This, Lily Vaughn. You should have seen her back there rocking out during worship service. Just, she had her hands up. She was, she was bouncing around, just having a good time. But my goodness, what a beautiful girl. Huh? Aren't you beautiful? Special. Father, I just want to say thank you for the, the beauty in this little girl. In the future that you hold in her hands, in your hands, God. I pray, God, your blessing, your strength, your insight, your uh, endurance over this young girl, her mom, and her entire family. And ask, God, that you do good things through this special little one and her mom and her family. In Jesus' name, amen. And help her not to break my glasses. Otherwise, we'd be out early. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've got a picture of my oldest, my sister, who's the oldest one in our family, uh, that looks just like that. Um, amazing to see that. All right, so um, today, um, if you have your Bibles here, I want to ask you, you can open up eventually to Colossians chapter 3. But I've been watching um, the Olympics, um, taking great pleasure in a lot of different things. And I, I'm going to ask if you guys don't mind if I turn off one of these lights. Do you all mind? Uh, I think I'll grab this guy, just for the heck of it. Um, anyway, the Olympics have been fun to watch. A lot of really cool stories, uh, a lot of people involved. And um, our, we have a graduate from Lewis Clark State College that ran for our track and cross country team. Uh, his name is Sam Atkin. And he competed for his home country, which is England, uh, in the Olympic Games, in the 10,000 meter run. And um, watched him get into the thick of this race, you know, just, I mean, he was a phenomenal NAIA division racer. I would say he could have competed at the NCAA level as well, uh, but uh, he came to LCSE. Mike Collins is a phenomenal coach, um, has a lot of international runners on his team, and Sam set, uh, set a bar so high uh, in the NAIA. He was a national champion, and when he went back home, he had, had this vision and, and dream of competing in the Olympic Games, and he made their team and uh, competed. And uh, talking to Mike Collins, he said, man, the pace was perfect for his style of running and his personal best. Uh, that he thought, oh, hey, this, this young man's got a chance because they're going really slow. They're bunched in a pack, which can create problems. Anyway, about halfway through, um, something happened, and Sam walked into the infield, limping drastically. Um, he had a, 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 an injury when uh, the last year he was here, and he thought he was through it, but it came up on him again, which really sad. You think about that, you know, the different kinds of things that take place. But it's been so much fun. I watched a, um, a young girl, a young, a young lady from the Philippines win their first ever gold, uh, medal of any kind. And it was a gold medal in uh, weightlifting. And this, little, this young lady was so jazzed about all of it, just ecstatic about things. We had, um, I can't remember the name of the martial arts, but we had the first ever uh, woman from the USA win a gold medal in, I can't remember the name of the, the, that event, but it was like a form of wrestling and jujitsu. Um, and that was cool to see her. Um, Norway, I think, won their first ever medal, if not first ever gold medal, in the two-person skull, the rowing. That was awesome to watch. And ever since I've read that, men and the boys in the boat, there's been a special attraction to watch the rowers and how they compete. Uh, one, one group even uh, overturned. I think they were, that was a doubles team. Anyway, it's been really fun watching this stuff. However, uh, unfortunately, we as humans can hurt things. And... Um, 
I'm going to bring up the name of, of, of a world-class athlete, uh, a phenomenal competitor. I believe a very courageous young lady named Simone Biles. Okay? Simone Biles is a world-class gymnast, has won the world title um, uh, two or three times. She's just a phenomenal uh, electric kind of gym, gymnast, it, whether it's on the, is that me popping and cracking? Could be, could not be. Um, on, the, on the uneven bars, on uh, the floor exercise, and on the balance beam. Just, I mean, she caused concern on the judges when she first entered the scene because she was so uh, beyond what they had been used to seeing. Just a really, really great uh, competitor. Um, she did a vault uh, and landed oddly, she thought. Uh, no injury, but she withdrew from the games, okay? Which, which put some pressure on the rest of the team. The team responded phenomenally. The team real, whoever, t the young lady that took her place, I think it's Suni Lee, I think was her name, uh, took her place, uh, won a gold, I believe, and a bronze or a silver in the overall. Just a phenomenal young lady. However, what happened in the 24 to 48 hours after Simone Biles began or withdrew was an embarrassment to this country and to us as Christians. Because I, I listened to... Uh, national speakers, uh, conservative talk show hosts, the, Dex the, the Texas Deputy Attorney General, some pastors, a guy named Charlie Kirk who was the founder of something called uh, Turning Point that uh, was founded with uh, Jerry Falwell, all of them trashing this young lady. I mean just trashing her, calling her a quitter, a sociopath, a selfish, childish, national embarrassment, a shame to this nation. I mean, I, I listened to some of this stuff and just thought, what is wrong with you guys? What is wrong with what your, what, where's your mind? More so, where's your heart? Where is their heart in all of this? We have become a nation uh, and, 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 a, and a body of believers, and I put myself in the middle of this, that has lost a heart of compassion. We really have. We have gotten caught up with, with so much selfish arrogance that we have a tough time finding compassion and mercy, humility and love. I was very glad that that attorney general, the deputy attorney general from Texas, his name is Aaron Reitz, deleted his tweet, which was ugly. It was absolutely ugly. And then apologized um, to Simone Biles. This girl, Simone Biles, has demonstrated more courage than any of these people and many of us combined. She uh, experienced an, a continual number of years of sexual molestation in her childhood and into her teens on the behalf of her coach, who eventually got arrested and was sentenced to jail, thankfully. She won the World All-Around Championship uh, several years ago while in the midst of doing something that I don't think I could even sit in a, in a building, and that's passing a kidney stone. She competed on the national level. In the midst of that pain, won a world championship. Overwhelming pressure. She's 24 years old. But the, for the last four or five years, she has received and been the target and the focus of our, the world's attention in the gymnastics world. Lots of endorsements, lots of pressure on a 24-year-old. Remember what you were doing at 24? I'm talking not just the pressure of finding a job and, and going through college. I'm talking about the pressure of meeting the demands of everybody that wants a piece of you. Amazing. One, one person wrote this. This girl has endured more trauma by the age of 24 than most people, especially the heartless people putting her down. We've lost a sense of compassion as Christians. Arrogance is loud, it's filled with self, the boast of self. And religion and self-righteousness showed up big time when this poor young lady said, you know what, I can't do this. I, don't, I mean, I competed at the college level one year of minor league baseball. I have no idea of the pressure. I thought that was pressure. I have no idea of the pressure that this young lady experienced in so many different ways, Yet, let alone all the various dark, shadows of having been molested year upon year upon year with sexual deviance. Unbelievable pressure that this young lady went through. She deserved more than that. So we've got all kinds of stuff going on in terms of people not having compassion that God calls us to, which is what we're going to read about in Colossians chapter 3. 
to remind me, I need to be reminded of being compassionate. You know what sometimes where we're not the most compassionate? One in here, but also in our families. In our own families, we have a lack of compassion. I'm guilty of having a lack of compassion even in my own family at times in which it's like, okay, God, help me to love no matter what I think. Help me to help no matter what I feel. Help me to be your hands, your heart with this person in my family. We have lots of arrogance. You know, the first thing that God hates when we read about it in Scripture, when he says there are six things that God hates, seven that are an abomination to him, the very first one, verse one says, haughty eyes. Haughty eyes is boastful, prideful arrogance that says I'm better than anybody else, I'm better than you, I'm better than that. It's all about me. And that is rampant in so many different places. Greg Locke, who is a pastor of a church in Tennessee, I'm going to bring this up because this is a gentleman who was married for a number of years, has several children, uh, had uh, an ongoing affair with his administrative assistant in this church, when it was discovered, he divorced his wife, married the administrative assistant, and never missed a beat of being a pastor in front of people. And did so with a degree of, I did it. And I've helped other pastors who have struggled with the same thing. This guy should have been out for a while. Just like if something were to happen with me, I need to be moved out for a while. Whether that's for a period of months, six months, a year, whatever it happens to be. But he stepped right back into it in the arrogance that said, I am needed by God. Well, this is something that also is part of this. And that is that because there is this CDC push, who knows what's going to happen with it, that maybe we're going to need to be masked up in a, in a, in a little while. He says this to, to his congregation, to anybody else out there, somebody looking for hope, somebody maybe looking for an opportunity to discover something about who Christ is and the power of his love. He says, if you start showing up with all these masks and all this nonsense, I will ask you to leave. We will escort you to the door. There's no compassion in that. There is no sort of compassion about people who may need to be masked up because of their own immunity systems, their own issues. But he goes on a, on a rampage about that, and there are cheers and applause about those kinds of things. That is haughty eyes, full and forceful, boastful, prideful. These are, there are other voices that are out there, but they get drowned out by the loudness of that kind of arrogance. Last week, I, uh, I listened to parts of uh, Nick's message, and I really appreciate him stepping in. But he mentioned a word, and that is that today Christian, Christians seem to have become the only ones that are unintolerable. Tolerable. I agree. I think we've earned it. I'm going to say that very carefully. I think we have earned some of this because of instances like this where arrogance loses sight of who we are following. And that is the most humble person, God, in the world, in the universe. You ever heard, you've heard the term ruthless, haven't you? Somebody's ruthless. I've played against and I've worked with people who are ruthless. You know where that comes from? Like the book of Ruth. Ruth was somebody who was not ruthless. She is... Uh, someone who had compassion on Naomi, her mother-in-law, whose husband and sons had died, and who was alone, who needed someone. It would have been easy for this Ruth to be ruthless and just say, you know what, I've got my own life to live, see ya, you're on your own. Yet she didn't. In an act of selfless compassion and empathy, Ruth went with Naomi back to Bethlehem and settled there with her. That's compassion. That's the kind of compassion you and I as Christians are called to. Paul tells us that we are to be the aroma of Christ to God, to those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. I'm going to read two different voices along the same lines of what I've just talked about. Simone Biles is the first one. A guy named Benjamin Watson. I bring him up because he's a strong man of God, a very devout Christian, family man. He's also a former New Orleans saint. Sorry, I just thought that was good. Benjamin Watson is a, an outstanding Christian man. I love listening to him preach and speak. And he says this of Simone Biles. I was proud of her leadership and her courage. I'm praying for her. 
And he says this to all of us. If your fanaticism trumps your care for humanity, you need to check yourself. That's huge. I'm going to read this story about Max Lucado. I love Max Lucado. I love reading his stuff. I love listening to him. Uh, I remember a number of years ago when we were at New Bridges and uh, uh, we all went up to uh, um, Spokane to listen to Third Day, Max Lucado, and Michael W. Smith. It was an odd kind of combo. You got two, two musical groups and then Max Lucado. You remember that guy? You, you, Kathy, you guys were on that trip, weren't you? That was awesome. Um, we, when we got there, we walked in. Michael W. Smith was singing that um, This is the Air I Breathe. And uh, I mean, the, the, the concert hall is, is dark, except for some lights here and there. And it's like we're listening. We walk in and we hear him singing this. And he turns it over to the crowd, singing This is the Air I Breathe. And it was goosebumpy kind of stuff. It was awesome. And Max Locato came up and he would speak in between sets by these mus musical groups. Anyway, Max Locato. Uh, contacted COVID after having the SHOTS series, the series of SHOTS for Pfizer. The 66-year-old pastor and best-selling author who is in quarantine in his Texas home for 10 days describes his symptoms of having like three cases of flu, but he's grateful he's not experiencing breathing problems and he's using the unexpected downtime to intercede with God for other people. On July 25th, Lu Lucado posted this, groan, COVID found me. Tested positive yesterday. Yuck. Still, there is reason for thanks. Good doctors, amazing wife. I'm at home instead of a hotel. My dog likes me. <laughs> Though miserable, the misery would have been worse with no vaccination. So doing my best to count my blessings. Help me, with the, help me put this time, listen to this. Help me put this time to God's use. How can I pray for you? Heaven knows I'll have time to do so. Post any prayer needs, and I'll gladly pray on your behalf. As of that date on the 20, I think it was the 28th, more than 11,000 people replied to him with prayer requests. That is the aroma of Christ that draws people in who are looking for love and compassion and the kind of things that take place. When the pastor went to the urgent care, two younger patients in the nearby waiting rooms were coming undone with their COVID symptoms. Instead of quarantining, instead of quarantining, Lucado, Lucado was supposed to be on an epic golf trip to Ireland with friends, describing it as a trip of a lifetime. But he has another vo vacation to look forward to, an upcoming trip to Mexico with his wife, Danaylan, to celebrate their 40th anniversary. Meanwhile, Max Lucado writes this, our good father can't catch COVID. I think I'll hang out with him. That's a voice that I'll follow anywhere. I will not follow any of these voices anywhere. I won't take a step towards these other voices. I will follow those that seem to have this kind of empathy, compassion, and always pointing back to Jesus Christ. This pulpit, this stage, this church is all about Jesus Christ and who he is and how he wants us to live our life and we as Christians, and I'm throwing myself into this, have lost our way in terms of compassion, empathy, grace. We need to be able to do that. Max Lucado, while others were not pointing to Jesus, the, the folks that I mentioned earlier, Max Lucado pointed everything back to his heavenly father and saying, how can I pray for you even though I'm doing this? Max Lucado could have railed against anything and everything, but he didn't. He chose to point people to Christ. That's our call. Our call is to be compassionate, to be passionate, to be humble, to be the kind of believer that emanates a fragrance that draws people in who, don't have, who feel like they don't have a hope, who are lost, who are hurting, who are struggling in their life. To be a fragrant aroma through compassion, mercy, love, and humility. I'm going to ask this question, then we're going to read this passage in, in, um, in Colossians. How do we know the loving heart of our Savior? How do we know the loving heart of our God, our Savior, who climbed on that cross? How do we know that? We're going to read about the clothing that Jesus wore and lived in each and every day out of Colossians. Do we know the heart and the love of our 
compassionate Lord and Savior by his overthrowing of a government or a military? No. Nor by his support or opposition of a political party or a movement? No. Not by out, out, an outlandish voice that vilifies people and puts people down. The only people he attached, do you know this, that he attacked were the religious leaders, the boastful, prideful, arrogant people who thought they were better than everybody else. We recognize the loving, compassionate, merciful heart of Jesus through what? His scars. His scars. Scars of willingly being humiliated. Scars of loving and serving others. Scars of sacrificing himself for others and the scars of putting others before himself. Scars of obedience to God through the power of his word to the point of saying, not my will, Lord, but yours. His scars, whipped beyond anything you and I can imagine. Flesh torn from his body, beaten, spit on, humiliated before crowds, given a crown of thorns that were pressed into his head, causing bleeding profusely around him. Scars of carrying his own cross, willingly crawled onto the cross to be spiked, not just nailed, spiked, long spikes into his wrists and his, le and his feet. The pain, unimaginable. He could have saved himself. He could have said, wait a second, this isn't what I signed up for. It says, it says I'm supposed to be blessed because I'm your son or your daughter. There's not supposed to be any suffering or persecution. Yet he hung on that cross. Why? Because he loved us. He loved us without question. All the way to the very end. Being mocked, being teased, being poked and prodded, hanging on the cross, all the way to the very end, he offered forgiveness and everlasting life to one of the thieves that he was crucified between. That is how we know the love of our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the same thing that he calls us to. So in, in Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 through, three, 1 through 4 and then 12 through 17. This is the clothing that should be in every one of our closets of our soul, our heart, and our mind. If then you have been raised up, big if, we have to make sure we answer this, yes, I've given my life to Christ, I plan to follow Him, not anything else but Him and the power of His Word. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. I'm going to stop right there. When we gave our life to Christ, Bill Haynes ceased to no longer exist. Even though I'm still here, it is Christ that hides me. I'm hidden in Christ. My goal or my hope, our hope as Christians, should be that as we live our life out, people should see, sense, and smell the aroma of Jesus Christ. That's who they should sense. Not me, myself, and I. Not boastful, prideful arrogance. Not selfishness, but the humility of a Savior who willingly went to the cross, who served others, who got onto his knees and washed his disciples' feet when they should have been the ones doing all the washing. I'm going to skip all the way down to verse 12. Here comes the clothing. Remember that hidden part. I'm going to bring it up a little bit later. And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, what's the first item of clothing? Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Look, that's a list that we need to see more of out of Christian leaders that are all over the media, that are taking the opportunity to shout, trying to shout above everybody else and condemning people and doing things that are not godly. These folks need to read this and understand that their clothing is not like this. I guarantee you that there's been times when my clothing was not like this. When I was arrogant and boastful. We need to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just that the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, 
which indeed, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Finally, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. This list is us as Christians, that this is our clothing. This is what we intentionally and purposely need to put on each and every day. It's easy to walk around in the flesh. It's easily, easy to walk around and, and be boastful and, and prideful, and trying to prove who we are. Yet, if we are truly hidden in Christ, we need to put on this kind of clothing so that we can be compassionate, so that we can be humble, so that we can love others with mercy and grace, so that those who are in need of knowing who Jesus Christ is as, as, as our Savior and someone who loves all will sense them. That humility, again, going back to the very first thing that God says that he hates is boastful. So he calls it haughty eyes. Look it up. It's about those who look down their noses at people. I am better than you. I am arrogant. They don't think they're arrogant, but they are. They're boastful. Opposite of that is that we are to consider others better than ourselves. The only way we can do that is if we put on the coat of compassion, of mercy, of humility, of love throughout that, all that time that we walk on this planet. We are to put on love. The principal evidence of being a Christian is how well we love others, especially those we disagree with, especially those we have a problem with, especially those who oppose us, and in the future, especially those who truly persecute us. We'll read a passage here in Matthew in a little while that talks about the need to love and pray, especially for your enemies. For us today, people are hurting out there, whether they're in the body or they're not part of the body. People are hurting. They need hope. They need to be able to understand that there is a God who loves well through how we speak, through how we carry ourselves. And I'm just going to go out on a limb. We don't, God does not need the kind of boastful, prideful arrogance that I've heard over the last week or so directed towards this young lady named Simone Biles or those pe uh, the pastor who's saying what he's saying about to the people in his congregation. We're called to love even in the face of persecution. I'm going to read Matthew 5, 43 through 46, then we'll get ready for communion. Matthew 5, 43 through 46. Jesus is busy teaching about personal relationships, about our, our life in Jesus Christ about how we are called to, to follow him. Verse 43 of chapter 5 in Matthew says this, but You have heard it, that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, and this is how Jesus loves to work, he, he talks about um, making things easier and harder, talks about sexual immorality, talks about that, that person who looks upon someone else and even thinks it is guilty of it. You shall love your neighbor and you hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in order that you may be sons in your father, of your Father who is in heaven. Pray and love your enemies so that you and I may be children of our God. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do, what, you, what do you do more than others? He's calling us to love others before ourselves, to extend ourselves, to be compassionate towards others. If the Savior of the world, who could have called down anything and stopped everything at a moment's notice, had compassion enough to save Bill Hain by crawling on the cross... I should, I need to, we need to be able to go to the closet of our soul each and every day and put on a heart of compassion, humility, kindness, mercy, and above all, love. So that the world out there sees something different than those who are loud, those who are shouting different things and representing Jesus. We wonder why people struggle with Christianity 
Not only has it had a history of this kind of stuff, but it's even amped up now more than ever because of the media. Because of how when one thing gets out there, I'm telling you, some of these people who were trashing Simone Biles, stuff has been written about them all over the place. All kinds of media. Intolerable? Absolutely. We've brought on a lot of it ourselves in how we have carried on our life, making people feel bad rather than welcomed making people feel like they're wrong for doing something that maybe I don't agree with. I had a really good conversation with Gary about some of this stuff. And he said, Bill, you and I could passionately disagree about something, right? I, I said, yeah, probably, absolutely. My wife and I disagree passionately about lots of different things. Yet we live together. We love each other. He said, we're called to follow a savior who gave us the prime example. And in, in, in the words of Scripture, we're given the recipes, the ingredients, the clothing to wear so that we are a fragrant aroma to a world that needs to be brought in and drawn in, not shoved away or pushed away. Our life can do that. Our life is meant to do that the moment that we give our life to Jesus Christ. And our flesh wars against it. You all, all of us struggle with that because the flesh wars against that. Because boastful, prideful, arrogance, selfishness, and self-righteousness weighs in and presses in. And the enemy loves using those things to hurt a church and to hurt people and to push people away. We read a story about a, a teacher. As we get ready for you know, classroom uh, here in a little while and teaching, uh, which I really have tried to push way out to the side. I don't even want to think about the fact that we're going back to, back to school. Right, Christy? Have you thought about it much? You have? Good for you. I have tried not to think about it. <laughs> I'm trying not to think about it. Um, I read a story about a, a young lady uh, who was a teacher, and she had a group of, of uh, international students who were coming out of uh, various camps, um, refugee camps, and populated her classroom. And she was teaching, this is like, a, I think, a seventh uh, or a, a first grade group of seven-year-olds. Uh, She's teaching about fractions in very simple ways. And she uses Hershey bars as the means of being able to teach this. Hershey bars broken in half and broken in a quarter. And she asks her student to the classroom, he said, which one would you rather have, this half or this quarter? And they're supposed to kind of figure out which is more, obviously, right? So they're going, she's going around and she's noticing that all of these refugee students that have come in are writing down a quarter. And she's thinking, I gotta reteach this lesson because they're not getting that which is more. They should want half. And then she asked these cl the classroom, she said, how come you only want a quarter? Their responses to, probably to every one of them was, so that all of us could have some. Some of the voices that are out there want the whole candy bar because they think they deserve it. We need to be the ones that settle for a fraction or even a square of a Hershey bar. Our God died on that cross so that you and I could show a world that's different than the loudness that goes out there, the loudness that's out there, and that which spreads ugliness on the behalf, unfortunately, of the name of Jesus Christ. And we do that by putting on a heart of compassion each and every day. I, need, I can be a better husband, a better father, a better pastor, a better employee, and I need to put on a heart of compassion for my work at the LCSC of kindness and humility and, above all, love so that those who need to be shown what love is and what, it's, uh, what the aroma is like, we can do that. Communion today. Been a while. Um, we had, didn't have communion last, last uh, month because we ran out of those little um, juices and wafers. So we're going to go back a little way, kind of meet halfway, okay, in terms of these things. I have some of the uh, fanciest kinds of, of wine uh, holders that you'll ever find, okay? These are beautiful, okay? But each of them has enough for one person, okay? So as you come up, there's going to be the bread that's broken already for you. I would ask you just to carefully grab and take your cup, eat the bread and drink the cup, and take the cup back and throw it in the trash on either side, okay? We betray our God often, whether it's through evil thoughts, whether it's through haughty eyes, whether it's through slander or gossip, whether it's through sexual thoughts, whether it's through sexual activities that are not uh, connected to being a husband and wife, what, whatever it happens to be, he went to the cross knowing we would fail him. He knew I would, I would fail him, 
I'd fall flat on my face. And he still went to the cross for me and you. So today as we get ready to take communion, I'm going to take us back just real briefly to the fact that Jesus knew you and I and everything that we would do the night that he broke this bread. And yet he still went to the cross knowing that we would betray, we would fall short, that we would need him in so many different ways so that we would be a body of believers that draws people in and not pushes them away. The night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took that bread and he broke it. And he told his disciples that this is my body, a body that's going to be broken beyond compare, beyond anything. And it's broken for you. When you eat this, remember what he did. And then he gave him the cup, a cup of a new and everlasting covenant and agreement between he and, he and us that says this is the cup of a new and everlasting covenant. Blood that's shed for you for the forgiveness of our sins. Take this and drink it. And when you do so, remember me. Remember me. The great thing about the opportunity that he puts before us is that, as the Phillips Craig and Dean song says, that there is always room at the table of grace. Always room at the table of grace. And the only way a world that needs to know that is how we carry out compassion, how we carry out loving actions and kindness, not with boastful arrogance. That kind of table is closed off. We need the kind of table that's open to anybody. And we do that by compassion, love, kindness, humility, not boastful, prideful arrogance. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, we fall short. We fall short of your glory. And Father, as we read this morning, in, in Colossians, that when we give our life to Christ, we are hidden in you. We're hidden in you. We are part of you because you have come into our life through the power of the Holy Spirit, through your resurrection, that we would be able to live out our life as people who draw others to you by how compassionate we are. Father, help us to be more compassionate. I pray for that young lady named Simone Biles. That that young lady whose courage is, is beyond measure, that God, you would help her. That Father, you, at, already I know that uh, over the, coming, the following days, there were numbers of Christians coming to her support. Help us to be more like that than those voices who put people down and shout people down. Father, you have called us to a life of humility and serving others before ourselves. Help me to practice that more in my home. Help me to practice that more in my church. Help me to practice that more in my work world so that others would see something that's different. And it's not because of me, it's because of you. That points everything back to you. Father, as we take this time in some level of kind of seriousness because of the sacrifice that you made for us, help us always to be mindful of the essential fact that the tomb is empty and that God you are alive through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us to give us the power the strength and the ability to endure the ability to preach and speak your word and more importantly to live out your word as we read about today father we love you in Jesus name amen when you're ready come on up and if you've had communion here before you can take some time up here if you'd like to uh, pray together uh, on either side uh, just Grab a piece of bread, take some time, one cup, and make sure you put the cup in the garbage on the sides, okay? When you're ready.
Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. He's risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. church proclaim Christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come away come away come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again come away come away come and rise up from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Singing, oh, I mentioned the, uh, the Olympic competitor from the Philippines, the weightlifter, you know, and, and I can't remember how much she um, both, I got to remember the, 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 there's the clean and then there's the jerk, but what's the one when they pull it? And, does anybody remember what that's called? Deadlift? No, dead, it doesn't deadlift just go right here. Some of you are like, who cares, Bill? Power clean, is that what it is? Where they go straight up like that and then hold it? Anyway, she did, when she got through, she was so much fun to watch because while other, others uh, that were lifting and, and when they get done, they just drop it, they'd walk away pretty serious. <laughs> and she would get done and she'd go, <laughs> she'd be hollering, she'd be waving it, and there's hardly anybody in the stands, but she'd be waving at people, going, <laughs> yelling and hollering. And when she won the gold medal, it was so fun to watch. Mind you, Here's one country, their very first medal of any kind in any way, shape, or form. And this this little power pack that's lifting weight that would crush me. I just think that's so cool. The, I know there's a lot of uh, controversy in, in Olympic Games, always has been. Uh, I'm going to recommend again a book called Boys in the Boat. If you ever want to reach a, read a good book or listen to a good book when you're on a long trip, Boys in the Boat is a great story about these these uh, nine rowers uh, from the state of Washington, all over the state of Washington, farmers uh, during the Depression era, and them going to University of Washington and, and competing on a national scale. And this is the part I like. They beat 
teams like Harvard and Yale. They beat them. I like hearing those kind of stories. Kind of like when, when I played at LC and WSU would come down, UW would come down, BYU would come into town and we'd spank them and they'd leave having lost two in a row. I like that kind of story, okay? But they go on to the 1936 Olympic Games at the height of Nazi Germany and who put on a great show right before they began their incredible persecution and win a gold medal. It's a great story. Great, great story. Um, man, today's supposed to be cooler. And it does not feel like it. Not feeling like it. We're just, Mick and I were talking about it. It's the first day of August. This is usually when we get this kind of stuff. So stay cool, stay calm, keep praying for rain. Never know. I know that Carrie ran into a huge storm when she went through Lapway this morning, just dumping on it. So hopefully that, that rain is moving around and hitting all kinds of different fire spots. Keep praying for those firefighters and all of us as Christians. God bless you. Have an awesome day today. Uh, let's all go home and take a shower now and, and get rid of all this stuff. God bless you.